Hello, everybody. How are you today? What a wonderful day. The sun just broke out, I heard. It was a little bit um, overcast, but it's a beautiful day for this event. Welcome to the 28th annual holiday train show. Did any of you get to go over there yet? Yay! Some of you are going after this, I hope. Um, it's a, today is a very special reading with Billy Collins, who's the Poet Laureate of the New York Botanical Garden. And also we have the readings from the winners of our poetry contest, who are right here in the front row. It is magical to have this marriage of poetry and gardens, to see poetry along our pathways in every season. And we owe it all to the beautiful partnership between the NYBG and the Poetry Society of America, which is now under the leadership of their brand new director, Matt Brogan. So in just a moment, Matt will introduce Billy, but not before I get to say a few words about Matt. So Matt Brogan comes to the Poetry Society of America after two decades in the nonprofit art world, including executive director of Seattle Arts and Lectures and program director of the Academy of American Poets. He was, founder of Na he was a founder of the National Poetry Month and has worked closely with dozens of important poets and writers in America and around the world, helping to reach new audiences and develop new outlets that put poetry at the center of American cultural life. Matt is also a poet and a writer whose work has appeared in the Antioch Review and the Brook and Rail and dozens of other literary magazines. He was here earlier this week, and we took a long walk through our native plant garden. I recommend the native plant garden. It's beautiful. We took a thinking walk, which is kind of like Piglet and Winnie the Pooh. They always take, take their thinking walks. And we shared ideas for future programs. It's clear to me that the PSA is in great hands and that Matt will help us create many wonderful programs that complement our exhibitions, just like this very one today. So here to tell you some more about today's poets and program is Matt Brogan. Uh, please join me in giving him a warm garden welcome. Wow, that was really nice. That was unexpected. Thank you, Barbara. Um, uh, the Poetry Society is really delighted by the long uh, and close partnership it's had with the New York Botanical Garden. Um, not only doing these events, but also uh, the poems that you'll see as you go around the garden, um, which we do several times a year in partnership with them. We've been doing it for many years. Um, so we're really grateful to our relationship with Barbara, Carrie, Joanna, and all the people here um, at the Botan Botanical Garden. Um, I also want to take a minute and, and congratulate all the young poets um, who entered the contest and who were selected. Congratulations. Let's give them all a hand. It's my pleasure to introduce Billy Collins. Uh, Pardon my benevolence, Billy writes at the beginning of one poem. And in this characteristic offhand way, he tells us something quite essential about his poems, I think. Billy's poems are many things. They're adventurous, they're funny, they're very funny sometimes. They sing, but they're almost always rooted in a sense of kindness, of generosity, of benevolence. And I think that's one of the reasons that he really likes coming here every year and doing this event and being with the young poets uh, who are going to read. Billy is, of course, one of America's best known and best loved poets. He's the author of 12 collections of poetry. He was poet laureate of the United States, poet laureate of the state of New York, and of course, Poet Laureate of the New York Botanical Garden. It's my pleasure to welcome Billy Collins. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, and uh, it's good to be here, and good to see all of you. Um, so I'm, um, I'm gonna read for a little while, and then we're gonna hear um, from our winning uh, poets all uh, 12 of them, or two, two aren't here, and I'm going to read in their place. Uh, so I'm really just opening for them. I'm the opening act, and they are the stars. 
of the next generation. Um, so I'm going to read a number of poems. Uh, the theme here is always sort of the same. The theme is poems about trains, poems about winter, poems about snow, and um, and I think, for one thing, an overall comment is, in, in my own experience, uh, both snow as a kind of weather, and trains as a kind as a kind of transportation are um, more conducive uh, to writing poems for me than any other weather or means of transportation. Uh, and if I'm on a train in the winter time, watch out. I mean, there's <laughs> lots of poems coming out of that. Um, I'm going to start by reading, I'm going to read mostly my poems. I mean, I'm here. Um, <laughs> Walt Whitman is not. We would, have, we would have heard something about that. But I am going to read a few poems by other poets. I wanted to start by um, reading some poems about trains and activities that take place on trains. And I'm going to read a poem by two poets, um, 19th century American poets, uh, Walt Whitman uh, and Emily Dickinson, and they each wrote a poem about trains. Trains were very new then, in the middle of the 19th century, in 1850, and so they're both reacting to a fairly new phenomenon. Um, and they are, if you take Walt Whitman and Emily Dickens, Dickinson, they're kind of the two pillars that hold up the uh, house of poetry in the 19th century, and they couldn't be more different. Um, so here is... Um, <clears throat> Here is Walt Whitman's poem called To a Locomotive in Winter. <clears throat> and notice it's to, so it's talking to the locomotive, a moving locomotive. Uh, and it's wintertime, so we've covered both winter and locomotive in one poem already. Um, he, the first line contains a word you might look up in the dictionary, recitative, which is a, a term in opera for when people are just speaking and they don't, uh, are singing, they're not singing in rhythm. But I think for Whitman it just means the, you, locomotive for my subject, for my uh, recitation. And you'll just notice he uses a lot of ing verbs because he wants to get the present action of the locomotive, the dynamic action of all its movements, a very new sight for someone in the mid-19th century. Thee for my recitative, thee in the driving snow, even as now the snow, the winter day declining, thee in thy panoply, thy measured dual throbbing and thy beat convulsive, thy black cylindric body, golden brass and silvery steel, the ponderous sidebars, parallel and connecting rods, gyrating, shuttling at thy sides. Thy metrical now swelling pant and roar, now tapering in the distance. The great protruding headlamp fixed in front. The long pale floating vapor pendants tinged with delicate purple. The dense and murky clouds out belching from thy smokestack. Thy knitted frame, thy springs and valves. The tremulous twinkle of thy wheels. The, thy train of cars behind, obedient merrily following through gale or calm, now swift, now slack, yet steadily careering, type of the modern, emblem of motion and power, pulse of the continent, for once come serve the muse and merge in verse, even as here I see thee with storm and buffeting gusts of wind and falling snow, by day and warning ringing bell to sound its notes, by night thy silent signal lamps to swing. Fierce-throated beauty, roll through my chant with all thy lawless music, thy swinging lamps at, at night, thy madly whistled laughter, echoing, rumbling like an earthquake, rousing all, law of thyself complete, thine own track firmly holding, no sweetness debonair of tearful harp or glib piano thine, Thy trills of shrieks by rocks and hills returned, launched over the prairies wide, across the lakes, to the free skies on pent and glad and strong. Um, you know, for Whitman, uh, this is an event that he's witnessing, and he's trying to get us to 
see the, all this motion through his eyes. It's not a past performance. It's a thing happening. And there's one odd line in here, which um, he says to the locomotive, for once, for the first time, come serve the muse and merge in verse. In other words, lo um, people didn't write about locomotives then. Locomotives were so new, they weren't really a fit subject for poetry. To put it very bluntly, uh, the subject for poetry was nature, not machines. And so when Whitman says, for once come serve the muse, he's saying that I know I'm taking on something that people aren't supposed to be writing about really, at least in terms of poetic decorum. Now here is Emily Dickinson who is, as he is sort of centrifugal, kind of outgoing motion, uh, talking about the skies and the fields, <clears throat> Emily Dickinson is centripetal, kind of the inward, inward facing action. And it's really a puzzle that she prevents, <laughs> presents. Her poems don't have titles. Um, she was very modest. She wouldn't you know, have an attention-getting title. She didn't even like to, she had her sister write uh, the address on uh, her, the letters she would write on the envelope because she didn't want the world to see her handwriting. That's how private she was. <clears throat> she never uses the word train. We're supposed to figure that out, but it's a pretty easy riddle. She says, um, one, there's one odd word, uh, boanerges, and for, for us it just means a preacher, someone who is vocal. I like to see it lap the, oh, she compares it, I mean, might as well just tell you. <laughs> she compares it to a horse. I like to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up and stop to feed itself at tanks and then prodigious step around a pile of mountains and supercilious pier in shanties by the sides of roads, then a quarry pail to fit its sides and crawl between, complaining all the while in horrid hooting stanza, then chase itself down a hill and neigh like Boanerges, then prompter than a star, stop, docile and omnipotent at its own stable door. I won't say any more about it, but she's um, um, giving, the, giving the locomotive or the train uh, the powers of uh, looking into houses and, uh, and then feeding itself at the tank of water. But then at the end, it stops, docile and omnipotent, so quiet and pow all powerful at its own stable door, which would be back in the station. So two very different languages. Now here's a poem by uh, Carl Sandburg. It's only uh, six lines long, and the title is Limited. And um, limited means two things here. I'll just tell you the first thing it means. The first thing it means is a limited train, uh, like a 20th century limited was a kind of a, a line of train. A limited train stopped. It means local. It stops. It, it makes lots of stops. Um, limited. I am riding on a limited express, one of the cracked trains of the nation, hurtling across the prairie into blue haze and dark air go 15 all steel, all steel coaches holding a thousand people, parenthetically. All the coaches shall be scrap and rust and all the men and women laughing in the diners and sleepers shall pass to ashes. I ask a man in the smoker where he is going, and he answers, Omaha. So Sandberg has this uh, vision of, uh, <clears throat> they call an entropic vision of everything turning into scrap metal, all the, tr the train and all the people per uh, perishing or coming to their end. And yet the man says, um, I know where I'm going. I'm going to Omaha. The word, you might hear the word Omaha come up again at some point. So here's a poem of mine uh, called Velocity. And uh, it's another kind of speed. Um, just like the limited is a limited kind of train, but it's a limit, the limits of mortality. Um, the club car is a feature of my train poems. 
velocity. In the club car that morning, I had my notebook open on my lap and my pen uncapped, looking every inch the writer, right down to the little writer's frown on my face. But there was nothing to write about except life and death and the low warning sound of the train whistle. I did not want to write about the scenery that was flashing past, cows spread over a pasture, hay rolled up meticulously, things you see once and will never see again. But I kept my pen moving by drawing over and over again the face of a motorcyclist in profile for no reason I can think of, a biker with sunglasses and a weak chin, leaning forward, helmless, helmetless, his long, thin hair trailing behind him in the wind. I also drew many lines to indicate speed, to show the air becoming visible as it broke over the biker's face, the way it was breaking over the face of the locomotive that was pulling me toward Omaha and whatever lay beyond Omaha for me and all the other stops to make before the time would arrive to stop for good. We must always look at things from the point of view of eternity, the college theologians used to insist, from which I imagine we would all appear to have speed lines trailing behind us as we rush along the road of the world, as we rush down the long tunnel of time. The biker, of course, drunk on the wind, but also the man reading by a fire, speed lines coming off his shoulders and his book, and the woman standing on a beach, studying the curve of the horizon, even the child asleep on a summer night, speed lines flying from the posters of her bed, from the white tips of the pillowcases, and from the edges of her perfectly motionless body. And um, um, I'll just skip ahead here. So a, a few poems about snow, and this, um, um, one of the nice things about snow is that, um, as I said, it's great for a great uh, atmosphere in which to write. And um, Howard Nemiroff has a poem, I'll, I'll say to, I'll read to you, it's a very short poem, but the title is, Because You Asked About the Different, <clears throat> sorry, Because You Asked About the Line Between Prose and Poetry. So someone else asked him, what is, what's the difference between prose and poetry? <clears throat> and he describes a winter day. It's raining, very cold rain, and then something happens to the rain. Sparrows were feeding in a freezing drizzle that, while you watched, turned to pieces of snow, riding a gradient invisible from silver aslant to random, white, and slow. There came a moment when you couldn't tell, and then they clearly flew instead of fell. Snow flies, rain falls, prose falls, poetry floats. And here's a poem called Snow, and it starts out with the speaker listening to a tune by Thelonious Monk on the piano. Snow. I cannot help noticing how this slow monk solo seems to go somehow with the snow that is coming down this morning, how the notes and spaces accompany its easy falling on the geometry of the ground, on the flagstone path, the slanted roof, and the angles of the split rail fence. As if he had imagined a winter scene as he sat at the piano, late one night at the five spot, playing Ruby, my dear. Then again, it's the kind of song that would easily go with rain or a tumult of leaves, or for that matter, it's a snow that could attend an adagio for strings, the best of the Ronettes, even George Thorogood and the Destroyers. It falls so indifferently into the spacious parlor of the world. If I were sitting here in silence, reading the morning paper, or reading Being and Nothingness, not even, let, not even let, letting the spoon touch the inside of the cup, 
I have a feeling the snow would go perfectly with that. And here's another um, snow poem. Um, it's called Snow Day. And we know, um, and all the school children especially know the difference between a day, or rather, the difference between, between a snowy day and a snow day. <clears throat> snow, someone has to declare that it's a snow day. And one of the things I do in the poem is use a kind of metaphor of. Um, of politics or political overthrow in the beginning. Also, it's an example of a poem uh, that gets sidetracked, that, um, that becomes uh, disproportionately interested in some aspect of itself and has to be called back to the poem. <clears throat> snow day. Today we woke up to a revolution of snow, its white flag waving over everything the landscape vanished, not a single creature to punctuate the blankness. And beyond these windows, the government buildings smothered, schools and libraries buried, the post office lost under the noiseless drift, the paths of trains softly blocked, the world fallen under this falling. In a while, I will put on some boots and step outside like someone walking in water and the dog will porpoise through the drifts, and I will shake a laden branch, sending a cold shower down on us both. But for now, I am a willing prisoner in this house, a, sympath a sympathizer with the anarchic cause of snow. I will make a pot of tea and listen to the plastic radio on the counter, as glad as anyone to hear the no news that the Kitty Corner School is closed. The Ding Dong School closed. The All Aboard Children's School closed. The Hi Ho Nursery School closed. Along with some will be delighted to hear the Toadstool School, the Little School, Little Sparrows Nursery School, Little Stars Preschool, Peas and Carrots Day School, the Tom Thumb Child Center, all closed. And clap your hands, the Peanuts Play School. So this is where the children hide all day. These are the nests where they letter and draw, where they put on their bright miniature jackets, all darting and climbing and sliding in the yard, all but the few girls whispering by the fence. And now I am listening hard in the grandiose silence of the snow, trying to hear what those three girls are plotting, what riot is afoot, which little queen is about to be brought down. I just think those little groups of girls outside the realm of play are up to no good. Um, something in mind. Um, OK, a few more here. Um, well, this is a fairly new poem that uh, has an epigraph, a familiar one from uh, T.S. Eliot, and the epigraph is, April is the cruelest, is the cruelest month. And that's something to think about, <clears throat> the ways in which April might be cruel, because they don't initially come to mind. Um, and the poem is called A Terrible Beauty. <clears throat> Excuse me. A Terrible Beauty. If you happen to miss this year's cruelest month competition, it began with all 12 contestants taking the stage together in the order of the calendar year, each dressed in outfits that sung of their personalities, March windblown and wet with rain, October resplendent in red and orange. Many wondered why April, a perennial loser, would even bother to show up, always smiling, daffodils embroidered on her bodice. Some blamed it, blamed it on reading a poem she'd read somewhere. Others followed her early elimination, August with zinc slathered on her nose, December looking like the mother of God. It must be said that no one was surprised when the tuxedoed man with the microphone finally announced this year's winner, the same as every year since its beginning. Even though she'd shivered during the swimsuit part and stumbled when asked how she planned to change the world, February was the obvious choice. 
I mean, the Super Bowl's over by then and spring's a mile away. What could be crueler, as one guy put it? <laughs> and that was about it, except for the coronation. There she stood, the only month on the stage, crying a few chilly tears, a thin smile frozen on her lips. Then she bent her knees a little so as to be less tall, and some official placed on her head her latest dripping silver crown of ice. So we always knew February was the, was the crueler one. So I'm going to read um, just, I think, two more poems. And one is called um, Christmas Sparrow. <clears throat> um, there are some subjects in poetry that um, there should be someone to announce to poets that you just can't write about that subject anymore. One of them would be a, a, a bird caught in, a, in an airport, right, in a, in a big airport terminal. And if poets just see that, and they just, you know, you know they just immediately start in. But, but this was a sparrow that, um, that got caught in, uh, in my house. Chris, Christmas sparrow. First, the first thing I heard this morning was a rapid flapping sound, soft, insistent, wings against, wings against glass, as it turns out, down spare, downstairs when I saw the small girl. Sorry, let me start this again. The first thing I heard this morning was a rapid flapping sound, soft, insistent, wings against glass, as it turned out, downstairs, when I saw the small bird rioting in the frame of a high window, trying to hurl itself through the enigma of glass into the spacious light. Then a noise in the throat of the cat, who was hunkered on the rug, told me how the bird had gotten inside, carried in the cold night through the flap of a basement door, and later released from the soft grip of the cat's teeth. On a chair, I trapped its pulsations in a shirt and got it to the door, so weightless it seemed to have vanished inside the nest of cloth. But outside, when I cupped my hands, it burst into its element, drip dipping over the dormant garden in a spasm of wing beats, then disappearing over a row of tall hemlocks. For the rest of the day, I could feel its wild thrumming against my palms as I wondered about how the hours it must have spent pent in the shadows of that room, hidden in the spiky branches of our decorated tree, breathing there among the metallic angels, ceramic apples, stars of yarn, its eyes open like mine as I lie in bed tonight, picturing this rare, lucky sparrow tucked into a holly bush now a light snow tumbling through the windless dark. And um, I'm going to finish with a poem uh, because um, I can, and I am the poet laureate of the Botanical Gardens. And, and I was asked to write a poem about the garden, so I know uh, we're here, and many of you are, are, have walked around a little bit, even if it's a, it's a little on the cold side. But So it's simply called The, the Botanical Garden. In Venice, the art of getting lost is not hard to master. Cross a little bridge, make a right turn, and the hotel you just left might as well be on Mars. The same goes for these gardens botanical, where a jungle of dripping ferns may give way to a desert where a cactus waves at me with its outspread arms. Here I can stroll at ease from one climate to another, passing herbaceous peonies, pale lilacs, and the stout hyacinth. And after I lean back to salute a palm, the mazy outdoor paths will lead me beyond their brick designs to a hillside where I can see at a glance as many daffodils as William Wordsworth saw. And beyond that lie the shadows of a woods where I find a shaggy hickory, an American larch, the blue spruce, and the cones of a white pine now underfoot. I know all this because I often stop, not just to inhale a climbing rose, but to read the tags and learn the names. 
I once looked up from one and saw in the distance through a break in the trees the white conservatory looking like the greenhouse of a king, center of all this growth and flowering life, the place where I'd started out to meander over these variegated fields, first cultivated, then wild, unguided by a map or plan, and glad to be delayed by a single petal, distracted by some anonymous branches, mottled bark. So that's the, that's me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. And now, for the real show, um, so as, we, as was said earlier, um, the young people who are, are they're gonna come up and read one by one, and um, uh, they were chosen by me, who else, um, uh, from uh, uh, hundreds or so, I, I forget how many entrants, but a, a big pile of them, and I thought these were, uh, these were the best. And they also were, were assigned something, which is tough to, uh, to assign a creative mind, um, but they're mostly poems about snow and, and the experience of, of winter. Um, so uh, we're going to start. They're going to come up and, and read their poem here or here. And I'm going to get my stuff out of their way. And let's see, there's a, yeah, there's a spot for them there. OK. And uh, is there a little thing to stand on? Do we, we thought we were going to have a stool or something to stand. There we are. OK. <clears throat> Okay, now, um, so our first poet is, uh, please welcome her, is Annalise Braddock. they stand. Up at the top, the wind dances while snow gently patters down to the world. Lights flicker and snow falls, bringing warmth to everyone. If you listen, you can hear the skyscrapers in the snow speaking. Puzzling or not puzzling, they know what they're saying. There they stand, tall and proud. Our next poet is, is uh, Matteo Bruno. I should say their grades. Matteo's in the fourth grade. The winter beast. In all our homes it comes to roam. The winter beast is ready to feast. It will mitten munch, scarf swallow, boot loot, bewail. As corner spreads through the air, it lies in wait on subway floors, behind taxi doors, it is a goggle grabbing, glove grinding, sled stealing winter beast. Uh, the next poet's absent, so I'm going to read his poem. His name is Leo uh, Biren, I think is the way you pronounce it. And he's in the sixth grade. And the title of his poem is Winter. Snow piled on the ground three feet deep at least, icicles hanging from my garage door, the air frigid, a million daggers clawing at my precious skin. The wind howls in my ear as if it is speaking to me, ice crunches under my boots, freezing my feet. The trees look beautiful, decorated by snow, as white as an angel's wings. Snow falls from the sky, Winter has come. <clears throat> and, uh, and then uh, Ella Hanchet. In, in, Ella, come up here, and she, Ella's in the third grade. <clears throat> Christmas in the city, according to a pigeon. I live under a bench in a city park. My feathers are the color of dirty snow. I look out from under my bench. I see many human feet 
running, racing, rushing through the slush. When I get tired of watching boots, I fly up to a lamppost. I see colorful lights, flashing, blinking, shining, twinkling. Usually I smell exhaust and garbage, but today I smell cookies and pies and pine trees galore. Searching for the source, I fly through the city. Finally, I find a windowsill. I watch a family, decorating, baking, laughing, smiling. And uh, our next um, poet is from the fifth grade, and it's uh, Amity Doyle. Falked winter. The, tr the few trees are bare, their branches covered in transparent icic icicles. The snow falls on our middens, then melts and disappears. We go to Central Park and ride down the hills of our, on our sleds, watching the limp trees and benches go by. Just like us, every little kid is bundled and covered up warmly, making sure the cold of the winter can't get in. Like guards and knights, never letting enemies seep in through the doors. And um, uh, the next poet is not here, so I'll read her poem. Her name is uh, Arpita Rasa, and um, she's in the eighth grade, and her poem is called First Snowfall. First Snowfall. My family has come from Bangladesh, they complain about the bitter cold of winter. One of them looks at the sky. What's that? I tell them that it's snow and that it happens when it's cold. They are excited, having heard of it before. The youngest runs out to play with it, and I must run behind her with her coat. The middle two go out with my brother and start a snowball fight. The oldest takes a photo of the sparkling snow to send to her relatives. After that, we all warm up with some hot tea. It was the perfect snow day. And Midhad Hassan is next. Midhad is in the eighth grade. Winter thoughts, winter thoughts in which I drown, the, the tall oaks and pines all around, the harsh wind finally dies down. Gazing upon deer sprinting by me, brushing through needles from a pine tree, breathing fresh air free from strong debris. Uh, good, and next is Lena Resend. Lena is also in the eighth grade. Christmas morning. I rub my eyes, get out of bed. Santa came, my sister said. She was right. Under the tree lie presents so big. Some red, some blue, some purple too. Under the tree lies four presents. I pick one up. Oh, it's not for me. <laughs> And uh, the next poet is Abigail Feinstein, also of the eighth grade. When I think of winter, I think of food I like to eat. It starts with Thanksgiving turkey and meat. Sweet potatoes with marshmallows on my plate piled high. Food, family, and gratitude ending with pumpkin pie. The weather turns cold outside, there's snow. After hours of sledding, warm up with cookies and hot cocoa. Happy to shed big, comfy sweaters and sweatpants piled in mounds, not only to keep me warm, but to hide the extra pounds. And then before we know it, the holidays arrive, the time with family, the gifts, and more food in which I thrive. We celebrate Hanukkah, then Christmas Day, we have a plan. See a movie, eat popcorn, then Chinese food for dinner. I am a big fan. <laughs> And uh, our last eighth grade uh, student is uh, Rizzo uh, Ramusevich. Mm -hmm. 
Magical winter, winter in the city. Bundled in big furry coats, scarves wrapped round throats. Children hold their sleds tight, ready for a snowy fight. Uptown, midtown, all lit bright, no need for a flashlight. In need of hot cocoa, listening to a guitar solo. Everyone building a snowman, top prize for the best man. The day coming to an end, winter starts to descend. And now we're moving to some uh, mature poets. Uh, in the ninth grade, we have Annika Aman. A Winter's Reverie. There's a snapping crackle of the fire's twinkling glow and the powdery banks of some white fluffy snow. There's a peppermint scent that pipes in through the vents and there in the chimney is a Santa-shaped dent. There's a growing excitement that shows on your face as you dream of toy soldiers and dolls dressed in lace. There's a quiet static on the radio with the comforting chords of the songs we all know. And then in the stillness, a change in the air, rustling up snowflakes from here and from there as the clock ticks on slowly, the world smells of pine, and we fall asleep knowing that it's winter time. And finally, from the 10th grade, um, Alexandra O. Oh. Holiday huzzah. The sixth train flies by, sweaty bodies rushing in. They're all different, yet the same, an NYC kin. Boxes and bows, our eyelashes frozen. Each scrambles to pay, their gifts not yet chosen. The rush has returned, sails skyrocket hard. Arms fly around, clutching bills, credit cards. The children can't wait for their holiday mornings. It's the laughs and the smiles their hearts are adorning. The season's back, folks. Here it comes once again. We know that it's coming, but never see it begin. It hits like the breeze circling Lady Liberty and radiates over the island and her ocean's vicinity. And can, can, we, uh, can we have a combined applause for the next generation of American poets? So thank you for coming. I want to thank Barbara Corcoran, who um, introduced uh, Matt and, and uh, runs things, it seems, at the Botanical Garden. And uh, I want to welcome Matt as the new executive director of the Poetry Society of America and thank him for his introduction. I want to thank you all for coming and um, I want to thank all our uh, winners, uh, our poetry winners that we're all very proud of. I know some relatives are here and they couldn't be prouder of you. Um, so if you haven't seen the trains yet, I think they're still running. Um, and thank you very much. That's our program. Thank you, Billy. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Matt. And all of you for coming and the poets for reading. You should know that outside in the Ross Gallery, just outside that door, we have a lot of Billy's books, his poetry books for sale, and he will be signing books. So join us. Enjoy the day. Thank you.